Memory Transcription Subject, Captain Sovlin, Federation Fleet Command. Date, Standardized Human Time, October 20, 2136. The feeling of teeth in my shoulder produced a sharp pain. The joint was about ripped from the socket as I was dragged across the asphalt. I wriggled in the predator's jaws, punching its snout to release its grip. The stabbing of my long claws drew blood, and it tossed me onto the ground with a shake of its head. My body slammed against our metallic shuttle, all I could see was stars. The pounding of my heart was a nauseating experience. This must be what my family felt as they were toyed with, before being turned into a screaming meal. I couldn't give these arcs or cattle fiends the satisfaction of screaming or crying. Maybe it was worth some sort of plea, to get them to spare the Harchen. The sole option that crossed my mind was to invoke the humans. They were the only ones the Greys had a remote respect for. If the primates had directed the Arcs or Dominion to this vulnerable civilian populace, perhaps they would abandon anything the Terrans allegedly claimed. Stop. I squealed. I'm a human slave, on a mission to expose the Federation's lies. When they killed your sea cattle like you say, they want, want to get the details for you. To my amazement, the grey paused in its stalking position. The humans did claim the Gojit home world, and we recognized their stake. I can smell them on your fur. But where are our fellow predators, if you're their property? They wouldn't set you free. T they have my family, I sobbed, with fake despondency. I'll do whatever they want, even if it's harmful to the Federation. Confusion flashed in Silene's eyes. The Harchin reporter knew my family was long deceased, so that lie wouldn't fool her. I didn't understand why the prey reptiles hadn't made a run for it yet. There were no good options, but stalling the Arxer gave them a small window of escape. The bloodied predator flashed a snarl. Clever. But why are you on this world? With those who attacked Earth? These Harchin are P-priority assets for the humans. I don't ask questions, but I'm as sure it's for a good reason. Let us leave, please. The Greys conferred for a moment, and inspected a smoking section of the shuttle hood. I couldn't believe they were listening to any of my bullshit. There was a brief flicker of hope that we might fall under Terran immunity. Plopping myself upright, I nursed the wounded arm with a ginger touch. Talking to them is revolting, but the Arcs are just confirmed that this assault is retaliation for Earth. Silene was right. What have the humans done? We'll let you leave as a token of good faith, slave. We mangled your engine though, so you'll need to find another way off-world, the Arxer spokes monster decided. But the Harchen stay. I think you are disobeying your orders, to save our enemies. The prey reptiles scampered back into the stairwell, only to find themselves blocked by a laughing grey. A single beast must have landed on the roof, cutting off any escape. They intended to flush the Harchen out into the street, one way or another. My eyes widened in horror, as the greys herded them into a cage. Stop. T the humans want these four as media tools, really, I pleaded. The vicious predator snorted. The humans want all of them dead. On that matter, it just so happens our interests align. I wondered whether the Terrans would enjoy the sight of the panicked Harchin reporters, sealed together in a degrading heap. My imprisoners would despise this raid, wouldn't they? The cage door slammed shut, and the Arxer gestured for me to scurry off. It would be easy to save myself, but I couldn't watch cattle be hauled away. My gaze darted over to my gun, which had fallen into the dirt. Odds were, I could only get off a shot or two, before the greys mowed me down with prejudice. I had to try something to rescue these Harchin, no matter how suicidal. It was a matter of waiting for the Arxer to lose focus, and accepting that I was about to die. Is there a problem? A throaty snarl echoed from my right. Carlos stomped across the road, clad head to toe in protective pelts. A flashlight was mounted to his helmet, and his binocular eyes hid behind a glass visor. 
A massive gun rested across his muscular forearm. I was never so elated to see a flesh-eating predator in my life. But what the hell is my guard doing here? I don't even know that he won't leave the Harchin to their fate. Or worse, laugh about it. The human stopped a few paces from the Arxer posse and crossed his arms in a formidable stance. The talkative Grey, who must be the unit leader, sized up the omnivore. It narrowed its eyes with blazing ferocity, challenging Carlos' will. I didn't know how the UN soldier faced that stare. The reptilian predator bared its fangs. Your slave wants to help these Harchin escape. It is using its subjugation as a cover, claiming this is done on your orders. Carlos' pupils flicked to the cramped cage. You heard Sovlin in his true orders correctly, he's an obedient servant. We want to send a message to the Federation, and these are the right individuals for the job. Simple. A relieved sigh escaped my lips. I was grateful that the human backed me up, after I deviated our flight path to recruit Terran enemies. He might take these Harchin prisoner or even execute them, but he wouldn't eat them. His kind wasn't like the Greys. At worst, I could reason with him and make sense of the questionable things he might do. Why can't you find another pet? The Grey hissed. We did all the work and we claimed this batch. These prey are of no particular importance, no different than thousands like them, with the same qualifications. Carlos shuffled closer. Our personnel selections are made off of data, simulations, and the best strategic minds on Earth. Are you questioning our judgment? Yes. I am. Say it again, you fucking coward. I am questioning the judgment of weak, naive primitives. You haven't a clue what you're doing, or what it means to survive in this galaxy. The human rose up on his toes, and pressed his slender nose inches from the Arxer's maw. The gray straightened, as Carlos tried to match its height. It breathed a deafening snarl at the UN soldier, but he wouldn't back down. Defiance glowed in the primate's eyes, despite being outclassed. I could snap your puny neck with a single bite, the Arxer roared. Carlos jabbed his gun barrel into its stomach. And I could blow your intestines apart, with a single finger. But we're on the same side, so why don't we work this out another way? Bumph. A contest of strength. You fight me one-on-one, -on -one without those overcompensating weapons of yours. If you win, you can have these Harchin. I'm game, if you'll agree not to bite. Unless you think you're too weak to fight without overcompensating fangs. Oh, let's do this. I'm going to beat the snot out of you, human. The Terran soldier backed away and tucked his rifle off to the side. He raised his clawless paws in front of his face, forming white-knuckled fists. What was to stop the Grey from executing him, now that he was disarmed? Luckily for Carlos, it was itching to release its aggression. The Arxer lunged at the human with a blunt swipe, which was barely dodged. It lashed out with a tail sweep, knocking the guard off his feet. The monster whirled around with quick jabs, which the primate blocked with an elbow. Carlos rolled out of the way and scrambled back to a standing position. He looked slow and toothless compared to the reptilian, not managing a single swing of his own. Carlos scurried backward and tried to deflect the oncoming barrage. Sweat glistened on his olive skin, tears showed in his artificial pelts. The Arxer aimed a jab at his abdomen, but the human danced away on nimble feet. While he was focused on the claws, it swung its snout at him with force. The truncated maw nailed the guard right in the chest and sent him flying backward. The poor guy is getting his ass handed to him. Why did he think this was a good idea to negotiate? Damn humans and their aggression. Carlos sucked in a wheezing breath, but hopped back to his paws. The gray charged at him once more, and the human pummeled it in the nostrils. It shrugged off the punch with a snort. The UN guard attempted to deliver a kick, but the reptilian caught his frail leg. It snickered as the human flailed, hopping on one leg. 
This isn't even a fight. The Arxer tugged the primate's ankle and knocked him onto his rump. It dragged him through the dirt for several paces. We may treat you like equals, but you don't make demands of us. You don't intimidate anyone. Carlos kicked its clasped paw with his other leg, wriggling free. You haven't beaten. Stay down, weakling. I've kicked the shit out of you. No one to admit defeat, basic humility would do you good. The human began to rise, only to be nailed across the mouth by a tail lash. Crimson blood bubbled on his lip, and he spit the liquid into the dirt. He rolled onto his back, watching as the arxer gloated in its victory. His hand darted to his head, wrenching the flashlight off his headgear. He shone it inches from its left pupil. The arxer shrieked as the brightness flooded its gaze, blinking. Carlos popped back up on wobbly legs and staggered in grappling range. The human drove his knee into its stomach before tackling it with all of his weight. He rolled off to the side and wrapped an elbow around its neck. The gray struggled to break loose, but its oxygen supply was dwindling. Game, set, and match. Tap out, Carlos gurgled. The gray palm that the human's elbow with feeble swats, its hideous eyes bulging. Carlos released his grip with a toothy snarl. It coughed several times, caressing its throat. The creature struggled to get back to its feet, and the Terran helped it stand. You, cheated, it sputtered. No weapons. The UN guard shrugged. I didn't use a weapon. Just an illumination device. You broke the spirit of our sparring, which is cheating to my eyes. You show little respect to your allies, and you're lucky I like your reverence. Take the damn Harchin, it's a whopping four cattle. The Arxer slunk off with narrowed gazes, as their leader hobbled away. True to their word, the demons left the Harchin's cage behind. The relief that flooded my veins was indescribable, though my hammering heart wouldn't pipe down. I raced over to the human, and flung my arms around him with choking sobs. Carlo stiffened, and pulled my paws off him. Uh, yeah. Don't do that, man. Sorry. I'm just really grateful for your help, I muttered. What are you doing here? Keeping an eye on you, obviously. We were concerned about your little pit stop, and followed you down here. I would appreciate if you'd not go around calling yourself a slave in the future. It was improvisation. Can't argue with results. Speaking of improvisation, you put the whole mission at risk with this little stunt. The fuck were you thinking? It was supposed to be a brief, easy trip. I wanted someone I knew, a friend, on the team. I've dealt with enough people who hate me in recent weeks. Whatever. Let's get your friends out of there. Hope they understand we're the only ride out. If they run off, I'm not going to stop the greys from nabbing them next time. The human unclasped the cage door and watched as the Harchin tumbled out. Silene inspected the predator with petrified eyes. Her comrade seemed repulsed by Carlos' lumbering form too, squealing as they returned his stare. The journalist's eyes darted to the side, as though they wanted to run. D did you tell the Arxer to attack us? Silene blurted. Carlos narrowed his eyes. I don't know, that's above my clearance level. If we did, it was likely to deter your forces from attacking us. The UN wouldn't want this to happen. I slumped my shoulders. Not even people like Samantha. Wouldn't she want the Harchin to feel the same losses as Earth? An indignant cough came from an abandoned vehicle behind us. Upon closer inspection, the female human was stretched out behind cover. A thin rifle barrel with a glass ornament was propped on the ground. She must have been monitoring the interaction the entire time and watching Carlos back in case his confrontation went awry. I don't believe people deserve to die for what they are. That's the Federation, she growled. If an individual renounces their government, I'm sure Earth would welcome them with open arms. 
now the ones responsible, complicit, or indifferent. Carlos cleared his throat. We parked a few blocks away. Somewhere we wouldn't be visible to the whole world, Sovlin. Stick close guys, and follow us. The human retraced his route with delicate boot steps. His rifle was ready if any Arxer crawled out of the woodwork, and Samantha fell in at his side. The predator guards forged the path for the Harchan journalists, ignoring their hesitance. It was remarkable to see the vengeful primates, aiding a species that partook in the attack days prior, memory transcription subject, Captain Sovlin, Federation Fleet Command. Date, Standardized Human Time, October 20, 2136. Bombs continued to crater the industrial city as we wandered through back alleyways. I tried to place myself in the human's mindset. It was brave, remarkably so, to wander this Harchin colony sporting a predatory appearance. Any frazzled prey soldiers would be happy to take a pot shot at an invading flesh eater, not differentiating the primates from the Arxer. The truth was, I knew so little about Samantha and Carlos as people. What compelled them to land amidst an orbital bombardment, on a world that bore nothing but hostile intent? Whether they assumed I was a fugitive or not, the Terran guards had no idea what awaited them here. They had no backup, and were outnumbered. The Harchin government thinks humans are a blight to be mopped up. If extermination officers here got their toes on them, well, it might make my treatment of Marcel look like summer camp. Footsteps scurried ahead of us, with no way of telling if the source was Arxer or Harchen. Yet the primates showed no signs of distress, plodding along their intended path in silence. I was stunned that Samantha hadn't berated the journalists for their species actions, she had been all too quick to lose her temper with me. Don't do anything to draw attention to yourselves. Carlos wiggled ahead on his stomach, the stealthy movements of a hunter inching up on prey. A Harchin patrol of seven or so with, uh, flamethrowers? In metallic suits? Shit, looks like they have thermal cameras. My eyes narrowed. Extermination officers. Great. And they're gonna see us as soon as they look this way, the mail guard huff. The Harchin journalist's expression seemed torn between excitement and trepidation. No doubt they were second-guessing the decision to escape with the humans, they just figured it was their only chance. I don't think they'd shed any tears over seeing my guards burn to a crisp, even if the predators saved their lives. What's with the flamethrowers? Samantha growled. I chewed at my claws. You don't want to know. The humans signaled a course to flank the exterminators with their hands and crept ahead. We peeked out behind the wall, just in time to see an Arxer death squad charging the Harchin. The prey reptiles crept back from the rabid beasts and lured them forward. Gasoline spurted from the lampposts at their queue, the built-in predator deterrent for our settlements. The oncoming Arxer were doused head to toe, and paused with alarm. The Harchin exterminators flung a match in the gas, spared from the effect by the flameproof garments. The screams were on another level, happiness fluttered in my heart, finally seeing the greys taste a bit of suffering. That was the agonized death these cattle collectors deserved. That was what I wished I could dole out to them for years. Carlos and Samantha looked horrified, however, watching the burning Arxer flail about. I guess I couldn't blame them, since that was what the officers would do to their kind too. The Harchin exterminators chased the greys with flamethrowers and steered them away from any source of water. My heart twisted as I thought about them putting the humans down like normal predators. Well, now I see what the flamethrowers are for, the female guard sighed. Must you burn predators at the stake? It's the worst way to die. I tossed my head in a noncommittal gesture. It cleanses the affected area. Not just of any offspring or other dens, but also any traces of their filth. I don't want to step in fecal matter that used to be an animal, no offense. Silene nodded in agreement. What if your traces and fluids get in the water supply? 
or half-eaten carcasses you leave behind attract more predators. Gross. You, as in humans? Samantha hissed. God forbid you might inhale some predator molecules on the wind. Carlos and I should be put down at once. The male human pursed his lips, leaning back against a wall. Sadness glowed in his eyes as he listened to the conversation, and I don't think he had the words to express it. For the first time in my life, I thought about whether animals deserved agonizing deaths. Why couldn't we put a bullet in the ones we saw, and then torch them? Terran presence was a contaminating factor, by technicality, I could only imagine the reactions of Venlal extermination officers. Nothing ill-fated had come from me breathing the same air as predators, or eating plants grown in infested earth soil. Our species had survived in eras where hunters left their excretions in the landscape, inhabiting every corner of our planets. The humans have shown us a different side of nature, even if some of it is disgusting. Suffering for what they were born as is wrong. I'm sorry, Carlos. Your life has no value to them, and they'll have no qualms about killing you, I said. That said, I didn't mean that you were filth. I mean, you need to shower, but... He snorted. You're an asshole. And you're a sweaty, bloody mess of a predator. If they could burn off just those grimy pelts and that outer skin part, that might be okay. The human flashed his teeth, and I hoped that was the friendly version of their snarl. Perhaps this wasn't the safest choice for cheering him up, but from what I'd seen, teasing was good for their mental state. If I had misread those cues, the guard might be socking me in the jaw in a second, my spines bristled with unease. Terran behavior sure was an elusive concept to gauge. Silani gaped in alarm at the sight of the predator's fangs on display. She seemed concerned for my safety, especially after I riled up the primate. The harchin shriveled away in disgust as he wiped the sweat off his neck with a towel. The male human wrapped the grimy rag around my neck, chuckling at my mortified expression. He looked pleased with himself. Sometimes, I almost like you, Sovlin, Carlos growled. Okay, we have to get across the square. Let's take these fuckers out, and don't walk under any street lamps. My reporter friend shared a glance with her colleagues. You're killing them. I'm sorry, are we supposed to let them fry us alive? Move out, and keep to cover. The human soldiers lined up their rifles, and marched out as a pair. The Harchin exterminators hadn't heard our chatter over the arcs or screams, they were leaving no chances of a grey living to fight another day. One officer was waddling toward us, pursuing a blackened cattle soldier that had collapsed on the street. Her head snapped up as she spotted our heat signatures, and she pointed at us. More predators. Humans, with hostages, she spat. Light them up. Carlos cleared his throat. Shit, there's no cover. Uh, maybe we can use you all as bargaining chips? Just pretend, of course. They won't shoot us with you leading, surely. Oh, they'll nail us too if they can't free us. Better dead than to be your cattle, I sighed. Though I imagine our deaths will be, quicker. Samantha rolled her eyes. Yes, real sapients don't deserve to burn alive. But predators don't feel anything, right? We were destined to be firewood, it's just perfect. Well, I for one like you guys not exterminated, so hurry up and find a hiding spot. Try the buildings. Carlos attempted to kick down an apartment door, but couldn't get the metal base to budge. He took a running start at the frame, and fell back with frustration. Samantha fired several bursts at the Harchin exterminators, covering for her partner. The enemy responded with their sidearms, while lighting the street ablaze in all directions. The Terran male glanced for another entry, before gesturing to retreat to the alleyway. The two humans ducked back into cover, their heavy breathing unpleasant to the ear. The Harchin journalists ran away from the confrontation, I chased after them with frustration. Thinking quickly, I wrestled the gun out of a burned arxer's paws. 
Get the fuck back here. I fired several shots at a balcony just above their heads and watched as those four dropped to the floor in unison. We need to get off this world before the cattle squads finish up shop or we're all fucking dead. Silani raised her limbs. Exactly. Sovlin, that area is on fire and the predators are shooting their guns at Harchen. I was trying to trust you because you've never steered me wrong before. But we need a new plan. There is no other plan. Yes, there is. The humans are distracted by the exterminators, let's go take their ship. We know it's close by, and there's not much time. We're not leaving them. Those two you see back there saved hundreds of gojid lives from the Arxer, and now, they're trying to save you. I care about them, don't you get it? The female journalist's skin morphed into a bright orange, mirroring the tone of the flames. Her pupil surveyed mine for several moments, and I realized my eyes were watering at the thought of my guards on fire. Slumping her shoulders in defeat, she scampered back toward the hiding humans. Her colleagues followed her lead, it was clear the close-knit team didn't want to separate. Seven exterminators charged through the alleyway, buffeting flames at the dumpster the humans crouched behind. Samantha unloaded a clip as suppressive fire, but she was cornered. Carlos cursed as his lower pelt sparked, an orange light danced across his kneecap. On instinct, he leapt up and shook his leg. An exterminator lined up their sidearm, ignoring the human's pleading shout of, Wait! I needed to get a few paces closer to make the shot, there was no time. Fear glistened in Carlos' eyes, as he tripped onto the street in a sprawled-out position. The fire had spread to his boots, and was making quick work of his pelt. I didn't want to see the predator die, but how? Silani emitted a high-pitched scream, and distracted the exterminators for a split second. I sprinted with the last of, the harch information wavered, they weren't used to predators wielding their devices. The extermination officers had flameproof gear to avoid this eventuality, but two sported tears in their suits from today's engagements. Samantha switched to her sidearm as the panic professionals bumbled into each other. She dished out two headshots before diving back behind the dumpster. That left three extermination officers on the prowl. While watching the human duo take out the majority of their comrades, they forgot all about the rogue gojid prisoner. I popped back out from behind the wall and sprayed gunfire with my claw locked on the trigger. Two Harchen figures toppled to the ground, Samantha didn't hesitate to terminate the final one. Carlos? You good? I questioned. Several grunts came from the alley. Fuck. Help me. The human's pant leg had almost completely burned away, little more than tatters. He kicked off his scorching boot, and his face contorted in a mask of pain. Those silly artificial pelts saved him from serious nerve damage, in all likelihood, but we needed to put him out quick. I tugged that sweaty towel off my neck, slapping it on his ankle. The flames began to dissipate as I smothered them, and the human rolled around to put out the embers. Samantha hustled over with a water bottle, breathing a sigh of relief at the sight of her partner unharmed. He rubbed the reddened skin on his leg and struggled to his feet. His limbs trembled as he tried to stand, the female guard supported him with a gentle touch. Carlos closed his eyes. Thanks, Sovlin and company. Let's get out of here. I think I've had enough for one day. Samantha studied me in silence with a little less venom than usual. The glint of surprise hung in her eyes. I figured she had expected me to abandon them when push came to shove. The curt predator didn't resist my aid when I propped myself under Carlos' other arm. She flashed pearly fangs and gave me a small nod. I see what you meant about their behavior. These humans help each other even when one is weakened, Silani noted and you don't seem alarmed by their snarls at all. That makes them capable of earning trust, attachment, loyalty. My nostrils flared with indignation. 
and it makes you wonder why so many species try to kill them, without giving them a chance. Assuming they have malevolent intentions, purely based on looks, is a recipe for disaster. It's not right. Before you jump to conclusions, I need a deeper dive into human history and everything the Federation has on pre-space flight predators. I'd like to interview the pale, angry one there. That ape isn't hiding their emotions, they would make a good contrast with Noah's polished speech. The angry human has a name, Samantha snapped. Unless you just want to refer to me as it. Fascinating. Why is this one like this? Carlos limped ahead, clinging to my neck. Sam's family was in Melbourne. Everyone she cares about, her relatives, her husband, presumed dead. No chance to say goodbye. Her home, off the map. Right that, us predators grieve our families too. I suspected the worst case when she visited me on Venlo Prime, exuding hostility. Samantha never shared much about her life, what she had imparted to Talpin that her brother was deaf. Her fondness had been unmistakable, with how thorough her offense was to the suggestion of him being killed. It was the first inkling I ever got of how tight Terran family units were. But the husband tidbit took me by surprise. Carlos hadn't mentioned any progeny, though perhaps she planned on starting a family in the future. I had no idea that humans mated for life, I always thought that predators bred for breeding's sake. It sounded like they coupled for purposes beyond producing viable offspring. Of course, humans were capable of love, but their familial obsession always seemed to be the kids. For predators, shouldn't procreation be a competitive selection process, driven by impulse? Parenting roles are a way of protecting offspring from rival mates, or so I thought. Poor Sam. The female human lowered her eyes. That wasn't your fucking place to share, Carlos. If you want to smear me for wanting revenge, Harchin, I couldn't care less. Just keep your racist thoughts to yourself. Now listen, if there is something more to your kind, I'm trying to unearth it. But I must start with your problematic arcs or ties, Silani explained. I also wonder how far humans will go, after the attack. It's strange that you freed us, Sam, since it's counterintuitive to your revenge. Revenge isn't about blind genocide. Now how about less chatter, more walking? Our posse trudged across the square, vigilant for any other activity. If any of my old crew saw me now, with a predator clinging to my body, they would have a conniption. Those arms built from the digestion of flesh felt warm and heavy, yet I wasn't disgusted by their touch. The emotional connection we established was hardly different than any other soldiers I'd served with. I wanted the humans to like me, to forgive me. We staggered onto the Terran's ship with exhaustion, and the Harchin journalists skittered aboard close behind. Silani was surveying the humans with interest, I could see the makings of a story brewing in her mind. Our little band was going to leave no stone unturned investigating the Federation. With a team of inquisitive individuals at my side, it was time to get the answers the predators desired. Memory Transcription Subject, Governor Tarva of the Venlo Republic. Date, Standardized Human Time, October 22, 2136. The fact that the Arxer came to Earth's rescue caused less of an uproar than I expected. It became a fact that was conveniently ignored by my government at large, Instead, we celebrated the brave Venlo who hurled themselves in the crocodile's path. Many talking heads were happy to sell the narrative that the greys were taken for fools, assuming the newest predators shared their wickedness. The general public were unaware of the looming deadline to trade for our cattle victims. That ticking hourglass was on my mind, as I accompanied Noah to the United Nations Remembrance Speech. The event was open to human refugees, I hoped that I could find the strength to treat the upset primates with kindness. The shock of the heartbreaking images on earth was beginning to wane, but my soul still ached for our friends. It was terrible to see an innocent species suffering without cause. This has all been so sudden, and I know you've had pushback from your opponents. Have we outstayed our welcome here, Tarva? 
Noah asked. I pressed my cheek against his forearm. Never. There's a few people that want you shipped off our world, soon as possible, but they're a minority. I'll always fight for you. Fight, huh? All that's left is fighting. My pops used to say space was our ticket to a better future. I'm glad he didn't see me fuck it all up. How disappointed he must be, if he's watching from the afterlife. Oh sweetheart, I'm sure he'd be so proud of you, and the man you are. There was nothing else you could have said to the Federation. What happened to Earth has nothing to do with your speech. Nothing, you hear me? I appreciate you saying that. I do. And if you don't mind me saying so, you look beautiful today. I had no idea how to respond to such a forward remark, coming from a human, but it did warm my heart. The dynamic between Noah, an alien predator, and myself was not something to address at this particular moment. Clearing my throat awkwardly, I tried to track down Elias Meyer. Earth's chief diplomat proceeded with grace in the past, but a nudge toward sensibility might be necessary. It was my hope that he lacked conviction in any violent rhetoric he touted. The last time I saw the Secretary General was when word of Earth's devastation reached Venlil Prime. The fact that their militaries tallied such a miserable failure and left their home at the Arxer's mercy morphed the dignitary into someone else. The distraught Meyer had promised to rend every enemy from limb to limb before rushing off for an audience with that ghastly chief hunter. I hadn't been sure he'd survive an encounter with a predator that openly called me dinner in our brief encounter. But the gray-haired human here now, mingling with alien dignitaries, was the person I knew. Meyer had spent his lifetime building relationships with unique cultures. The only aspect he was unaccustomed to was the constant terror prey felt. But he was mindful enough, careful not to show his teeth to non venmal His hands were kept in his pockets, to avoid gesticulating. Glad you asked about the Arxer, Meyer was saying to Cupo. When I spoke with them, face to face, their hotel room was pitch black. I couldn't make out much of anything, other than a massive shadow looming over me. There's a group of them, lying in wait, sizing me up like a cut of meat. And you still went in? When you wanted to run away, the Mazic president asked. What choice did I have? Our instincts are nothing compared to yours, but I was thoroughly creeped out. I do hope that you can forgive us for accepting their tete-a-tete, -tete, with 10,000 warships surrounding Earth, a dialogue felt much more palatable than subjugation. The other Federation representatives were crowding the Secretary General, eavesdropping. It was a relief, and a bit of a surprise, to see him conversing with those who didn't aid Earth. That smooth-tongued dialogue seeking the Mazic's forgiveness, not the other way around, was stunning. I had expected him to launch into accusations over the indifference of their allies. The way Meyer was acting a week ago, I thought Earth was going to isolate from everyone but us and the Zerulians. I don't know what made him come to his senses, but this is a positive sign. Cupo stepped forward on all four paws, shadowing the human leader with his bulky stature. I snorted with amusement, as I noticed Elias shuffle back. He tried to play it off as fidgeting, but the predator seemed nervous about the mazic's size. I don't think the sand-colored mammal realized the Terrans were equally intimidated by him. The Earth-born diplomats were well aware that a single kick of panic could cause serious skeletal damage. I appreciate your explanation, but it still leaves me worried that you're turning on us, Cupo said. Meyer coughed pointedly. There's a billion dead humans, and nothing will ever be the same again. Humanity stood alone, apart from the kindness of the Venmal, the Zerulians, and yes, the Arxer. Perhaps there would have been other options, if we received more help from our neighbors. I have never been dishonest with you, I don't trust you. I think humans should be given a chance, because you are our only hope. But placing my people in harm's way for predators, when that friendship is still a hypothetical, is unthinkable. Let alone raising arms against known sapiens who share centuries of partnered history with us. The Mazic tensed as he breathed out the last word, 
expecting the predator to fly into a rage. The other alien diplomats listened with interest, perhaps because they held similar reasons. The secretary general's pupils darted around, and his lips curved down with disdain. Was it my imagination, or did his hair look whiter than last I saw him? That's valid. It would have been easy for you to choose them over us, when it came down to the wire. I suppose doing nothing is a concession of itself, Meyer growled. Cupo blinked in surprise. What? I expected you to disown us. That's not why I'm here. Humanity, under UN leadership, will found our own federation. I want as many members in our alliance as possible. I've started a project, with promising results, to weed out alien fear responses. The Mazics are one of the races I think have the most potential, you could lead this initiative. This would require leaving the current federation. I would want to retain membership in both, if I'd even roll in the dirt with you at all. Tassa, the Nevik diplomat, flicked her cream-colored ears. I wouldn't do anything that causes further risk to our trading networks. We can discuss this on a case-by-case -case basis, Meyer said. What I need right now is for each of you to step up and bring the thousands of Gojid refugees we saved to shelters. Their colonies are also without a government and supplies, who knows how long the Arxer recognize our claim to them. We no longer have the power to do anything about that. Cupo flapped his big ears. I can handle that, Predator. The Gojids deserve help. Good. Beyond that, we politely request that you send aid shipments to Earth. Anything you can spare out of generosity to get us back on our feet. I hate having to beg so plainly, but my cities were turned into irradiated soup. The Secretary General's eyes darted over to the Sivkid ambassador, who had leapt into a waste bin at the first sight of humans. Perhaps it was time to confront her on her skittishness, though that would require a more private setting. While Meyer was on the topic of age shipments, this was the perfect time to slip to his side unnoticed. The Nevik ambassador pounced on Elias' perceived weakness and was rattling off a laundry list of terms. Tassa had attempted to barter for ownership of Luna and the asteroid belt in the wake of the attack, this was an obvious non-starter for the United Nations. This time, she was offering to manufacture ships and airdrop food in exchange for trade exclusivity. That was her true goal, to stop the Fist Sand Compact from landing advantageous deals. The Fist Sands often undercut the Nevix prices, and their trade war has spiraled to new heights. The fact that both of them reached out to actual predators, solely to screw the other over. Halmina, the Fist Sand representative, pointed her horn in a threatening manner. I landed here two days ago, after our first representative died, and you're trying to fuck me over? Human Meyer, I'll give you a month's worth of food shipments free, with no strings attached. Just don't agree to that. Predators, the Fissons will steal anything proprietary right under your noses, Tassa hissed. Do you want a species known for corporate espionage on your turf? Accessing military blueprints at the first opportunity? We didn't steal your technology. We built it better and cheaper, and you can't accept that. You used your monopoly to rip people off, so you can't stand competition. We turn a profit, which we deserve for the hard work of our brilliant engineers. You upstarts might as well be uplifts, with shoddy. Shut up. Noah roared. Is now the time for your stupid feuds? What about Earth? If you want shit from humanity down the road, try helping us for the sake of helping us. The tension that fell over the conference hall was so thick that you could cut it with a knife. Sifkit Ambassador Axley was banging her head against the waste bin, wailing at the predatory outburst. The representatives were lucky the media cameras weren't rolling and that the human refugee audience hadn't been allowed in the auditorium yet. Meyer scratched his head with discomfort. Well, I agree with him. A little charity and unity would be nice. I find the behavior of capitalizing on our misfortune rather, shall I say, predatory? The Nevik recoiled in shock, 
floored by a literal flesh eater, directing that insult at her. Halmina at least had the decency to look shameful, pawing at the mane on her long neck. Something flashed in Noah's eyes as he inspected her silver horn, he muttered something about fist sands, only needing hooves. I was beginning to wonder if my friend was losing it. Meyer glanced at a wristband, then gestured for everyone to find their position. He curled his lip at Axley's trash can hideout and pushed the squealing grazer into a back room. The auditorium doors were unlocked for public entry, and human spectators shoved their way inside. It blew my mind to see this many predators in one spot, on my own planet. I leaned over to the Secretary General's ear. I want to talk to you, friend. You deserve an overview of how we're treating your refugees. Not right now, Governor, but I have urgent information on the Ark, sir. You won't believe what Isif actually said, he replied. The gray-haired primate's eyes flitted to the entryway and widened in alarm. I wondered what spooked him about the incoming Terran refugees. There was nothing to make any of these people look more predatory than the others. If someone tried to charge the Secretary General, I'm sure his bodyguards would intercept them. It seemed paranoid to travel with armed soldiers nearby at all times, but humans were poor at assessing danger. Tarva, where the hell is the event security? Meyer hissed, through gritted teeth. There are a lot of important figures in one place. I snorted. You actually think people would march through that door and attack a public gathering? I, yes, I do. Damn it, you told us this was a secure venue. Get every diplomat to leave, only a few at a time. We don't want to incite panic. You think danger is lurking around every corner. Humans are safe here, Elias. I've guaranteed that nobody will try to exterminate your packs. You misunderstand, I'm worried for you. Any of us are capable of violence when pushed. You're dealing with humans who have lost everything and are looking for anyone to blame. Especially aliens, and especially the UN, understand? My focus turned to the incoming humans. Many were holding printed images of their cities or loved ones, and their predator eyes were stained with tears. Several Terrans were comforting each other with light embraces or hand squeezes. These people looked devastated and heartbroken, nothing like angry beasts planning to maul the fluffy aliens. Regardless, it wasn't like Venlal executed the attack. However, the level of jumpiness Meyer was displaying was going to interfere with his speaking ability. If he required muscle to assuage his paranoia, it was better than seeming unstable on a live broadcast. Who would be cruel enough to target an event with such a gut-wrenching focus? I hadn't thought Elias a man with delusions of grandeur, but maybe the recent power bestowed in him had gone to his head. The purpose of this was to console the hurting humans and honor Earth's memory. Even I know these predators don't just attack out of hunger. We'll postpone the ceremony, if you insist, I whispered. But you can tell it to our Federation guests. Elias sped off. The human exchanged words with the Fissans and the Paltans, they were the only two to send a replacement for the deceased ambassadors. Perhaps the Takans, Dosser, and Thafki were weighing their options, or they doubted the Predator's message. Regardless, the Secretary General made it a priority to evacuate the newcomers first. I suppose he didn't want to risk them losing another diplomat to a violent end. Whatever Meyer told the duo, it scared them sufficiently. Fearful expressions stretched across the aliens' faces, and they bolted from the auditorium without hesitation. Was that predacious delivery necessary? I glared at the human, willing him to be more tactful. Kupo stomped up to the UN leader. What are you up to? Is there a reason two ambassadors spoke with you, and immediately saw themselves out? Keep your voice down. Meyer hissed. You damn predators always keep me in the dark. We're in danger, aren't we? I am sick of having threats concealed right in front of my trunk. Nervous chatter swelled from the primarily human audience as the Mazic president made a scene. 
The fire alarm was activated by a bystander, and visceral screams echoed through the sprinkler doused room. Several Terrans made a beeline for the exit, pushing and shoving each other to get out. It seemed like the predators were verging on a stampede, which I didn't know was within their capability. The backpack. It's blinking. A human's thunderous voice permeated the chaos. Run. Ambassador Noah wrapped an arm around my shoulders and hurried me toward our emergency exit. I had no idea what had just happened, but it was tugging at my own panicky instincts. Through the chemical fog, I worried that someone was going to get trampled in this madness. Elias was irresponsible. We should have just proceeded with the speech, instead of. A deafening blast rocked my eardrums, and the subsequent shockwave sent me and Noah flying. The impact rattled me down to the bone marrow, making every nerve tingle. Vision slipped away, and my addled brain could only register an incessant ringing. Pain flared in my tail. Something sharp, like a needle or a glass shard, had impaled itself in the bushy appendage. I coughed weakly, trying to move my arms. My pupils flicked out toward the sitting area, where a charcoal-colored mist shrouded the vicinity. Humans closest to the blast area were soaked in blood, and some seemed to be missing limbs. Their open mouths suggested they were screaming for help. I still couldn't hear anything but high-pitched reverberations. Meyer crawled over, his attire caked in dust. The aged predator was sporting cuts across his wrinkled forehead, but his eyes were something alien. I'd never seen a human in combat mode in person, that dilated stare jolted some life into my veins. My brain recognized him as an animal, with the erratic eye movements and strained breathing. The secretary general stopped adjacent to me and jostled the shoulder of a face-down human. Horror flooded my chest as I realized it was Noah beside me. Elias punched at the ambassador's chest several times until glassy brown eyes blinked open. The elder Terran slapped the astronaut across the cheek, trying to snap him awake. Meyer's gaze searched for other survivors before resting on me. His lips moved but I could only make out hints of the sound. I think he was telling me to run away. The only reason I suppressed my fear of the adrenaline-fueled predator was concern for Noah. That worry was a sickening knot in my stomach, I needed to see him stand up. T. V. A. The human ambassador croaked. Get. Here. I had no idea if he was saying get out of here, or get over here, but I took it as the latter. My paws rushed over to his side, and his glazed eyes drifted to my tail. Horror flashed in his pupils, concern crossed Meyer's taut grimace as well. The injury must be worse than I thought, but I decided not to look. I didn't want to pass out now. Noah struggled upright, fueled by worry for me. His hand steered me onward, and his wobbly steps became more certain. My mind hadn't yet processed that humans had attacked their own remembrance ceremony. Right now, I prayed that there wouldn't be a follow-up strike from whatever deranged predator plotted this. Memory Transcription Subject, Governor Tarva of the Venlo Republic. Date, Standardized Human Time, October 22, 2136. When the humans began their cultural exchange, they shared the blemishes of their history. The satellite wars almost sent the powerful nations back to the Stone Age, by their own words. Federation researchers also documented the senseless atrocities of a prior era, and noted the uncanny resemblance to arcs or brutality. It had been difficult for me to picture the Earthlings acting so violent toward each other, those moral people killing millions of their race was unimaginable. The scale of bloodshed today forced me to reckon with that truth. I knew in my heart what the predators were capable of, but I hadn't wanted to accept it. Sweeping their history under the rug, in favor of the empathy tests and the charitable acts toward us, was easier. Talking with Noah and Meyer made me want to believe they'd changed as a species. Maybe even your human friends could act out of aggression, you've seen outbursts from both. They restrain it because of learned morality, empathy. But does Noah ever fantasize about killing people, 
just a tiny bit? Keep walking, Tarva. The Terran ambassador placed a trembling hand on my shoulder and made me jump. You can't go into shock. We need to get you to a hospital. Please, please, stay with me. Tears soaked my cheek fur. W. Where are the other alien diplomats? I'll look for them. But Tarva needs a tourniquet, Williams, Meyer growled. Yeah, I agree. Listen Tarva, if anything happens, I want you to know that I love you, Noah whispered. You don't have to say it, or feel it, back. I'm going to protect you. The chocolate-skinned predator scooped me up into his arms, passion alight in his binocular gaze. His visage became fuzzy, I felt cold, despite the warmth of his body. Saline swelled around his eyes, as he ripped his shirt sleeve off with his bare fingers. His nails had turned gray from grime and soot, and orange blood was smeared across his chest. There was a lot of it, sourced from my tail. Knowing the aggression hardwired into his genome should have struck sense into me. Humans were coded to be destructive and violent. Still, the fondness in my heart cried out louder than ever. My Noah was a little hot under the collar, but only when faced with injustice. I trusted him with my life, I couldn't make myself regret befriending the Terrans. I love, you too, I croak. The human's lips quivered, torn between a smile and sorrow. He wrapped the cloth around my tail tightly, and blinding pain rocketed up my spine. It felt like he was amputating the limb, wrenching it from my body with an iron fist. I yelled in agony, burying my face in his chest. His brow furrowed, as he finished tying the knot. The astronaut patted my head. It's done now, I'm sorry. I had to stop the bleeding. You're going to be fine. I don't know if I am. This was an isolated incident. Right? I whimpered. Honestly, we've had tragedies like this happen on Earth before, though it's rare. All I can ask is that you don't judge us by our worst individuals. This is why the Federation wants us all dead. Most humans would never do something like this. You know that. But what, kind of, monster would? I don't know who did this, or their motives. They're sick, with grief or some disorder. Anything I say is speculation, but we're going to hunt the bastard down. Air, pardon my word choice. If this was a drastic action born of anger, human emotions needed to be monitored under a microscope. I had tried to normalize the predator's stay and welcome them like any other class of refugees. But if there could be mass carnage any time a lone Terran was upset, I didn't know how safe it was to integrate them into our society. What other venues could be targets of senseless violence? How many Venlo lives could be lost? My vision began to dim as the fear chemicals lending energy tapered off. Ambassador Noah lunged at me with bared teeth, catching himself a hair short of my face. He released an incoherent roar in my direction. The feel of the predator's warm breath on my lips and the sight of maddened eyes inches from my face sent flight cocktails coursing through my veins. Electricity jerked at my muscle fibers. Instincts propelled me upright and sent me stumbling away blindly. It took me several seconds to realize Noah was intending to startle me awake. Triggering my flight response had jolted me back to consciousness, though that might not last long. I collided with Meyer, who had his back turned to me. Shit. Watch where, Tarva. Noah, you need to get her out of here, the Secretary General spat. The human leader had thrown caution to the wind, pressing his shoulder by a downed cupo's side. The mazik was bleeding from several places, including a mutilated leg. I appreciated Meyer's efforts, but he was going to be crushed if cupo fell. The old primate couldn't support a creature several times his weight. Leave him, Elias. You can't carry him. Come with us, I cough. Cupo flared his trunk. I am conscious, Tarva. I don't want to die, enough that I'm letting a predator touch me. 
My skin is crawling. The gray-haired human gritted his teeth. Nobody else is going to die on my watch. We have to help the big guy up, give him a fighting chance. Ambassador Noah frowned, before kneeling beside the Secretary General. The two humans pushed Kupo off his side and hoisted him back to his round feet. The mazik teetered on his legs for a moment, but the predators strained with the last of their might. I noticed scarlet fluid dripping through Noah's short mane. The sand-colored mammal swayed as he fixed a glare on the human. What the fuck happened, predator? You predicted this, so you clearly know. Oh, get to a hospital, President Kupo. I'm going to look for Tassa and Axley, Elias growled. Let me help. I can carry them, the Mazik president offered. In your condition? Just go, I'll deal with it. My eyes work just fine. You're not going to cover up these deaths. I won't leave until we find the Nevik, at least. Whatever. Look around, be my guest. Kupo glanced in every direction, before pointing his trunk at the arctic-colored biped on the floor. Elias released an audible gasp and raced to the Nevik's side. His slender fingers crept to the pulse point above Tassa's hoof. His binocular eyes closed, and he shook his head with a defeated expression. There was nothing but gore among the human spectators, with many primates dead or dying. First responders were nowhere to be seen, we were alone in this mess. The Mazic president took a final look at the decimated auditorium, before trundling over to the nearest exit. I imagined he would blame Meyer for this catastrophe for a long time. I limped over to the back room where Axley was, ignoring Noah beckoning me to the exit. Ironically, the Sivkit's cowardice in the trash can left her more sheltered from the blast than anyone. Her fluffy white form was huddling in the receptacle, unconscious. The rise and fall of her chest was visible, so I assumed she passed out from terror. Meyer was right behind me, and picked the Sivkit diplomat up with haste. That was not going to end well, if she woke up carried by a predator. Noah pointed us toward the side exit with a scowl on his face. Fighting off dizziness, I sandwiched myself between the two humans. All strength dissipated, as the duo ushered me through an exterior door. The shivering was unbearable, and my paws were becoming heavy as concrete. I want, I'm ready to sleep. So sea cold, I gasped at Noah. Please, don't scare me again. The human grimaced. We're almost there. Just stay awake a little longer, okay? A shaken UN bodyguard brought a bright red kit over to Elias, who deferred it to Noah. The secretary general couldn't administer first aid while his hands were full with the sieve kit. The astronaut popped open the lid and pried out the fattest syringe I'd ever seen. Before I could wince at the size of the needle, he jabbed it against my neck. An adrenaline surge caused my limbs to convulse, and I fell over, gasping. My heart feels like someone is squeezing it inside my ribcage. Sure hope my atrium doesn't burst. The hormones did the trick to stabilize my blood pressure, and I tried to get a grip on my surroundings. Rough shouts stemmed from a throng of humans by the main entrance, who were barely kept at bay by armored UN personnel. Those soldiers seemed to have been shipped by the truckload, in a hurry. Judging by the signs and vulgar language, the gathered refugees were protesting Elias Meyer's arrival. I heard about this gathering, since its organizers did apply for and receive a legal permit. However, the Terran demonstrators had moved away from the designated area in the wake of the attack. Some were pushing toward the scene of the blast, though I had no idea whether it was to help or to finish off the survivors. Others were escalating to violence, charging at the UN officers and throwing objects. What chance would Venlo police have of containing these animals? A few predators were setting fire to glass bottles, then hurling them at their surroundings. Historic row house lit up like kindling, once the picturesque shutters were swallowed by flames. Before my eyes, the Terrans climbed up the hood of a UN vehicle and began swinging a bat at the windshield. 
Surely these humans realized that didn't accomplish anything? It was terrifying to see their destruction spiraling out of control. This violence must not be as isolated of an incident as I hope. I thought you were an intelligent species. What is this? I cried. My shriek drew the attention of the mob, who began jeering at Meyer in particular. Several lobbed accusations about Earth, and they overran the UN crowd control with renewed focus. Rocks, bricks, and other blunt objects were thrown with intent to injure, Noah, herded me off with a rough grip. I hadn't felt this terrified of humans since first contact. I had no idea what motivated these creatures, or if they could even be reasoned with at all. As much as I loved the first contact team, allowing Terran refugees onto Venmo Prime was a mistake. We were going to have to get the current populace off-world, if they would still heed our commands at all. I would warn my advisors to implement stringent psych evaluations for any arriving humans. This was wholly unacceptable. These predators here had no care for who they might hurt, and today's death toll had to be in the dozens. I didn't want to judge humanity by their worst individuals. People like Meyer and Noah did not deserve to die for their deranged cohorts, blanket condemnation was not the answer. But the Venlo Republic just learned the hard way that we needed to be more selective in which predators we dealt with. Meyer's eyes darted around. We're going to restore order and fix this, Tarva. I'm so sorry. Bad things happen when a lot of angry humans get together. This will pass, love, Noah said. Glass shattered inches from my heels, and my flight instincts bubbled back to the forefront. Coupled with the given adrenaline, I found myself running at full speed. The screeching sound of tires on asphalt met my ears. A black sedan careened down the narrow streets, with no regard for any protesters in the path. The crowd parted at the last minute, raving and discombobulated. The secretary general pointed toward the car. Run, get in. This vehicle had an actual driver, who seemed to be switching between autopilot and manual steering. They popped open the side door, leaving our posse to clear the final few feet. I prayed that we would be able to escape from these beasts. This was what it felt like to be hunted by pack predators, and there was no hope of humans tiring from the chase. Noah positioned his body behind me, and shielded me from the projectiles sailing at us. A broken bottle nailed mired in the back of the head, which earned cheers from the crowd. Another human protester wrested a gun away from a UN peacekeeper, they began firing at the figurehead center of mass, without hesitation. The UN leader clutched at his abdomen and staggered toward the car. He dumped the sifkit over the threshold, somehow maintaining his grip. The elder human collapsed in a splayed position, which suggested the concerning severity of his injuries. I prayed to any deity listening that nothing had connected with my astronaut. Noah gave me a forceful push to the shoulders, sending me tumbling into the back seat. He dove in on top of me and tugged the door shut. The driver floored it away from the mob at max velocity. The Terran ambassador sighed in relief, before he turned his eyes to the secretary general. Multiple bullets had pierced through his stomach, and the leader was gasping like a fish out of water. Blood was oozing onto the floorboards, draining away with a steady flow. I realized with dismay that Meyer might need hospital care more urgently than me. It took a second to roll him over, so that I could stare into his dazed eyes. The human tried to sit up, but fell back with a weak groan. My paw raced beneath his neck, and propped up his skull. Elias' eyelids fluttered. Tarva, Chief Hunter Isif wants to help us. Stop talking. That's not important right now, I said. It is. I want you to make peace with the Arxer. Please, let, that be my legacy. The primate drew a shaky breath, and cued in on the hesitancy in my eyes. I didn't want to argue with a man who was fading in my arms, it was obvious he wanted those negotiations to work, at any cost. Perhaps it was true that Isif aimed to help humanity, the only other predators in the galaxy. 
but that Gray had outright stated that Venlo were lesser animals, a delicacy that he felt entitled to. That wasn't an open invitation to civil relations. What Isif said to you was theatrics. So he wouldn't be executed, Meyer coughed. He wants to end sapient farming and the war. Need better future. Likes your spirit. Told me so. I blinked several times. And you trust I, er, him. Why would lie? At his mercy. Meyer's eyelids sealed shut as his irises rolled back in his head. Noah pried a packet of human blood from the glove box and began feeding it into the Secretary General's veins. The vehicle was less than a minute from the hospital, but every millisecond seemed like an eternity. My own weakness was creeping back in, while the UN leader's breathing grew more faint. I didn't know if I could honor that request, despite Elias framing it as a last wish. As much as I respected his discernment, the likeliest answer was that the Arxer hunter was manipulating human empathy. Isif knew the Venmal Republic wanted nothing to do with him, his species had enjoyed every second of the war. Even if the Federation had starved the Greys, they used that as a free pass to slaughter everyone without exception. The tires squealed, and we veered over to the hospital's entrance. Squeaky voices alerted the other staff that an injured predator was on site, followed by recognition of this particular human. My mind was far away when Noah placed me onto a stretcher. Unconsciousness took hold as Venlo paramedics rushed two planetary leaders to critical care. Memory Transcription Subject, Captain Cal Sim, Crockett Alliance Command. Date, Standardized Human Time. October 22, 2136. The line between dream and consciousness grew blurry, I slipped between waking moments in delirium. Whatever drugs I was given seemed designed to keep me out of it, but there were brief flashes of humans putting my wing back into place. Rumbling voices cascaded around me and filled me with the urge to claw my way to the surface. The vivid dreams left my brain in anguish. My near-death experience had turned decades of rotten memories into a jumbled casserole. There had been one nightmarish case where we found an elderly crocodile ripped apart in her backyard. With a cruel sense of humor, my dream state decided to reenact the scene. Standing over the rotting corpse and seeing the innards tug from her stomach was the abyssal image of evil. Extermination officers were supposed to act in time to prevent these occurrences. I could feel a sour taste swell in my beak. It was followed by a scorching sensation as I regurgitated my meager lunch. My partners insisted on immediately torching the area, this body was defiled beyond burial salvaging. The victim's family would understand. Some faint remembrance told me that this was the case that made me transfer to the military. We never found the predator. I looked, obsessed, ran down every lead. Over here, a voice hissed on the wind. My wings flapped with urgency, and I sailed off in the direction of the call. All I wanted was to fry the animal that would commit this heinous deed. This had been the only predator I ever hated, my standard practice was to refrain from emotional judgments. It wasn't a hunter's fault for being born, but the existence of whatever did this was offensive to me as the Arxer. The scenery blended together with that dreamlike passage of time, the abrupt change wasn't jarring in the moment. Without warning, I was buffeted down by a brutal gust of wind. The forest clearing around me looked quite familiar, and my instinct screamed that something wasn't right. There was a neon fabric dome, a sapient-built structure which tickled something in my mind. Invisible forces tugged the entrance flap open, as though inviting me in. I inched closer, despite wanting to back away, on legs that felt like concrete pylons. Violet crocodile blood formed a thin trail across the grass, which returned a sliver of my resolve. A predator like this could not be allowed to reproduce under any circumstances. The bravado it had, to waltz into our settlements, meant it was a true abomination. My eyes were not prepared for the sight that awaited. Inside, there crouched a lanky, brown-skinned creature, 
which I recognized as an adult human. The predator was chowing down on a crocodile's gullet, and blood was smeared on its chin. How had an alien sapient gotten out here? It looked up as I entered, with feathers jammed between bloodied canines. Those brown eyes, with that awful pleading quality still present, belonged to Arjun. This must be that kid, all grown up, and now as ugly as the rest of his freakish race. Humans are not vicious, Arjun whined, in the childish register that didn't match its development. You're brainwashed, Kalsim. I tried to raise my flamethrower, but my wings wouldn't move. The predator bared its teeth, inching closer. I should have killed that conniving demon while I had the chance. It didn't matter that humans were capable of empathy when it was a selective concept that could be turned off like a light switch. What a curse, to be given the gift of sapience, yet to have such an atrocious form. The hideous monster sprang forward. Its unrivaled endurance meant that its bloodlust would never be sated. Any compassion was overridden by an instinct much stronger, that was what their history told us would happen, all along. The Federation needed to kill as many humans as possible, but I had forgotten that. Its clawless fingers pressed into my throat, and all I could hear was the pounding of my heart. I'm going to kill you. I shrieked, snapping upright. Savages. My head spun, and I realized I was in a ventilated building. The cool metal beneath my spine suggested I was on some sort of operating table, at least, I hoped that was what the tiny knives were for. My wing was bound in some sort of plaster, and gauze was wrapped around my aching neck. This must be somewhere amidst the predator-infested lands of Earth. The realization that it was a dream provided immeasurable relief. Thinking about the details, it was a senseless nightmare. Social hunters wouldn't wander and pick us off alone. Still, I couldn't help feeling uneasy at that peak of the future. It was tough to picture the human kid devolving and encroaching on Federation worlds with his brethren. I slid my talons off the table, clicking around on wobbly feet. Why had Arjun's father listened to its son's plea to spare me? Weren't the primates furious about the cities we destroyed? Arjun didn't deserve to suffer, but maybe I should have put him down. If I knew humans were such brutal hunters, their compassion wouldn't have swayed me. Those drawn-out methods are far worse than the Arxers. With a bit of hesitancy, I tested the door handle, it was unlocked. The humans kept their structures more sanitary than I expected, from creatures accustomed to constant blood and death. There wasn't any reek of predation, or biological markers left to intimidate me. Perhaps the Terrans realized I showed mercy to their kind, and stayed their hand? They were a cogent species, not the non-sapient terror I saw in my nightmare. Still, I felt like I should be bound or caged. Maybe the primates were testing whether I could be enslaved? That was the only reason I could fathom why they'd patched me up. Thoughts of Thion, the only surviving member of my party, raced through my mind. It begged the question of how long I'd been out, and whether that Marcos faction had sniped him. As I turned into a wider area, a gun was jabbed inches from my face. An adult human watched with a neutral expression, but I could see the hunger that lurked in those pupils. The alien predator looked like the result of a disastrous lab experiment, with its exposed face and glistening skin. I felt sorry for the prey races like the snake, that had to deal with these things marching around. What was that noise? You're going to kill me? Its eyes glowed in the middling light, and its dry lips tensed. That must be a cue that it wanted blood to wet them. I encourage you to try, bird. I squeezed my eyes shut. W was, N nightmare. T there's, no point to K killing you now. We failed. Kalsim thinks we're going to conquer them, Dad, Arjun offered from atop a footstool. Well, I don't think we'll have the chance, kiddo. The Greys beat us to the punch, or so I hear. Solomus clasped my heart, as I thought of the undefended Nishtal. The Arxer wouldn't pass up a golden opportunity, if it was brought to their attention. 
There hadn't been time to dwell on the reptile's arrival at Earth, but it told us a lot about the humans. The fact that the Terrans were a feeling people, who cared for each other, hadn't stopped them from jumping in bed with their antithesis. You are dangerous, and still I have shown you mercy, time and again. My home is gone. Do what you think you must, human, I grumbled. The father peeled back its plump lip. The name's Manoj. You have a sick idea of mercy, but my son is alive because of you. That's the only reason I'm not ending you myself, got it? I see. It is difficult to look a sapient in the eye and kill it, Manoj. Even for one of your spawn. What happens to me doesn't matter, I won't resist the execution squad. Come on, resist a little. I got wildlife doctors to treat you and your pal, with some reluctance. They gave in eventually, on the condition that I turn you over to UN forces once you're stable. Wait. My pal? Arjun told me where to find him, pure genius hiding spot. Look under the bedsheet, behind me. The full-grown human was positioned just right to obstruct my vision. On closer inspection, the tubes and wires behind the predator were attached to the farcel officer. Horror coursed through my veins, Thion was missing an arm. The jagged edges around his shoulder stump suggested teeth had sawed it off. Munoj must have gotten too hungry around the injured officer, and experienced a lapse in its control. I know it must be tough for a predator to stitch together a wounded prey animal, who was in a coma, but my gosh. You ate Thion? I checked both of my wings in a squawking panic. The human scalpels could have shaved off tiny flesh bits in fractions that I hadn't noticed. You're just like the Arxer. Munoj snorted. Damn, you're a fucking idiot. Human teeth aren't big enough, certainly not to do that so cleanly. That, yes, you're right, Predator. Then you fed him to the tigers, I suppose? Actually, it was leopards that got him. Same family as tigers, but with spots instead of stripes. Would have had nothing left but crumbs, except that I showed up when it was picking at him. Arjun was upset about it, else I would have let nature run its course. You're lying. We placed him in a tree, there's no way land predators could have gotten to him. Munoj pulled up a clip on its holopad, with a snarl born of cruel amusement. The human set the device down on a table, and I leaned over it hesitantly. A massive beast with a mottled pelt was walking up a vertical trunk, defying gravity with ease. Sinister forepaws hugged the bark circumference, while its hind legs moved like it was ascending ladder rungs. The predator's speed quickened without warning, and its hind legs pushed off. It leapt onto a branch in an adjacent tree, faster than any landwalker should be able to. I suppose these leopards were more than capable of scaling greenery in a blink. The only reason I could conjure why the Terrans kept such a beast alive was their arboreal roots. That aerial terrorization might be relatable to them. Munoj had shown me that they were quite willing to scale forest trunks themselves. The tiger reserve makes sense now. The humans respect this family of animals because they recognize the bestial common ground. The adult predator leaned back. So, we reduced the drugs keeping Thion in a medically induced coma. He's already starting to stir, this should be good. I assumed you would want revenge, Munoj, and I know it's just how humans are. But please, take it out on me. I gave the orders, I deserve your wrath. All Thion wanted was to stop predators from hitting any more worlds. He couldn't sleep at night knowing there was another Arxer out there. We're not the Arxer. Nobody understands that but me. I always saw your redemptive qualities, and how unique humans were. I wish that was enough, we both know coexistence wasn't an option. I'm sorry that it had to be like this, truly. It didn't have to be like this at all. We wanted peace, to fight alongside you, and you committed genocide against us for it. I wonder if there could have been another way. Human conquest is as inevitable as your growth. 
There are no future generations, for any other race, with you alive. The human scowl was growing more visceral by the second. I wondered if it was reconsidering its promise to Arjun to spare me. My exterminator training faltered, as its narrowed eyes bore into my skull. A fearful squawk bubbled in my throat, but I fought to ground myself. Beneath its anger, pain manifested in its increasingly hostile posture. The skin of its hands was tight around the bone knobs, which suggested waning control. My thoughts wandered to how Arjun had appealed to my morality and claimed Terran religions called for natural compassion. I reminded myself that those emotions were genuine, they didn't just disappear at adulthood. This father, monstrous as it was, resisted murderous urges in favor of its bond with its son. Perhaps if I appealed to that side, and continued to treat this ghastly beast with dignity, I could save Thion. Extermination officer is a dangerous job, where you're always on call. Not good for settling down, so I never had kids, I stammered. I have killed a lot more living beings than I like to recall. But I have to believe that somewhere, for how we slowed Earth's expansion, there's a hatching who will live to adulthood. A low rumble emanated from Munoj. There's millions of children, on both worlds, who are dead right now because you tried to kill us. All for our eye placement. Human, your eye placement is a symptom of a bigger problem. Predators do have forward-facing eyes, but it's much deeper than that. That's like saying a virus must be eradicated for its spike proteins, its actions, the infection and spread, are the issue. The adult human adjusted a rectangular object, which appeared to be a video camera. A red light blinked by the lens, and I guessed I was being recorded. That was a sensible action for intelligence purposes. Munoj bared its yellowed teeth, approaching me with shuffling steps. It traced an oily finger across my beak with a chuckle, before pointing my nose toward the camera. Say hello to the people of planet Earth, the predator sneered. You're being broadcasted to social media right now, wherever the internet still functions. Look the eventual millions who'll see this in the eye, and repeat your little virus line. I squeezed my eyes shut. You're angry. I don't hate humans for what they are. It wasn't personal, it's just the reality of the situation. It sure felt personal, drumstick. I happened to find footage floating around from the UN raids, a crocodile transmission sent to a downed ship. Those pink markings on this fella's beak look awful similar to yours, don't they? The Terran pulled up another video on its holopad. I recognized my own visage on the feed. An allied ship must have intercepted the hail we sent to the downed human, who had shown us a picture of its family. Pity swelled in my throat, as I thought of the offspring in its image. Those three primates had looked younger than Arjun, and now were left without a parent. For all I knew, they died in the bombings, and that UN pilot had sacrificed itself in vain. Surrender yourself to our custody, peacefully, and I'll see that you survive. The cadence of my voice was overlaid by static interference. You can ensure that your culture is remembered. Munoj offered a chilling grin, its alien features giving off contradicting signals. That's your mercy, Kalsim. A perfect view of the destruction of your planet, your culture, and everyone you cared about. Meanwhile, you're a prisoner among people who want your kind exterminated, forever. An exhibit in a twisted museum. I wanted someone to study your culture. I wanted you to be remembered. Fuck you. We could execute you, and that decision won't be up to me. But my suggestion, people of Earth? Let's give him the same mercy he offered one of ours. Let him witness the destruction of Nishtal in HD, while we keep him locked up, to document crocodile culture. My eyes shifted to the floor. There was never such an undercurrent of cruelty in my offerings. I had been trying to minimize their suffering, while Muno aimed to twist the knife. Crocodile culture was well documented by every Federation race, so it was not in jeopardy of vanishing from the records. There was no point to that existence. 
The humans viewing this video would demand a more violent end for me, wouldn't they? A motor revved outside the compound, and predatory shouts rippled through the air. Those must be the UN soldiers picking me up. I shot a final glance at Arjun, who was watching me with interest. The human kid raised a clawless hand as we locked eyes. Perhaps this was some gesture of farewell, like the tail signals of many species. The foresight of Arjun as a human adult floated through my mind again. I doubted I would ever see him again, but if I did, he would be something unrecognizable. These creatures grew out of the tolerable phase much too quick. Fighting off tears, I lifted my uninjured wing at him. The explosive noise of a door flying off its hinges pierced the air, Terrans couldn't do anything quietly. Goodbye, little predator, I whispered. Don't go scaring any more snakes. Dark fabric enveloped my head before I knew what was happening. Pure terror coursed through my veins, at the sheer number of humans I sensed around me. This was the largest concentration of predators I'd dealt with in my life. Part of me hoped that they would take me as a meal, instead of skewing my mercy into a revenge fantasy. 